uh, in the general software engineering, uh, there are different ways of approaching the problem of code quality or long-term maintainability. First thing is to make sure that we have the best programmers that are very careful and very diligent. And they like to write book about their code and it's very, very transparent. So you understand everything that is written then, there. The second approach that people use is to do some kind of automatic checking. Yeah? So people check uh, different statistics. And the third approach is to write the code every once in a while, trace modules, make it more modern, <coughs> and on the occasion ensure that the current staff is remembering what has been written. Uh, if these precautions are not taken, it's very likely that the code will be unreadable after a certain period and very hard to maintain. So there are different metrics that suggest this. Uh, one is defect ratio per, per code line or per uh, any code fragment. The other uh, statistics that is used as signal that the code is not very, very good is uh, the likelihood that uh, each bug fix or correction or change in the code introduces a new bug. A very famous point of software evolution was when uh, researchers at IBM have discovered that for each bug fixed in their operating systems that there was a chance to introduce more than one bug during the change. So that, that basically means that at this point of social revolution, with these statistics they had, it was actually impossible to decrease overall number of bugs in the code. Statistic. Code base was pretty pretty weak by that time. So I was uh, recently working with a bigger and bigger code bases, and I noticed that sometimes you just see in the code that certain things are difficult to read. So I thought I will borrow some of the techniques that people use for other programming languages to estimate how flaky or difficult to read is the code for the programmer. And that's how complexity was born. Basically a machine to make metrics about how code looks. It's very incomplete now, it's very preliminary stage, but I will welcome your comments and suggestions of what seems to be reasonable. So basically, if you have code quality, besides the, the defect likelihood, we want to know how complex is the code, how difficult it may be to write or rewrite it, and how understandable it is. These are usual markers. So at the small scale, there is a very nice tool by Neil Mitchell that suggests you improvements in the style of Haskell code. So basically, how to rewrite small fragments for them to be more concise, to use higher level constructs like structured recursion with foldar or map instead of explicit recursion. And there are also tools that help you tell that whether all your symbols or functions or data type are commented. It's now recommended practice to have at least a shadow comments. So at least the comments that explain what is the intent of each function, and unless it's really apparent from its name. And shadow comments for arguments, so what each argument does, especially if they, we have at least two arguments of the same type. And we can measure code complexity by the number of functions per module, by the number of interactions between functions, so which cause which, by the number of function arguments and record fields. The famous research in the psychology and of memory, basically, suggests that humans are able to uh, hold in their operation memory at any moment three to nine units, which uh, is not necessarily very precise, but that probably means that beyond nine arguments it's impossible to hold it at the same time in memory. So it would be possi possibly preferable to break it into functions that have rather three arguments, five arguments. 
The same applies to record fields. So it would be best to break <coughs> records with nine or ten fields into, say, record of records. If, especially if the, the record holds, for example, x, y coordinates of two points. That may be not, not a big, big deal, but if it's x, y coordinates of two points and also the contents within the record and also something else, like some statistics on it, possibly each of the points may be uh, taken as the whole data structure that divides the number of uh, components by two in case of points. The next thing is the number of types and classes. It's famous uh, to say that uh, too many novel type classes may easily contrive the code. As is for uh, too many types if they do not represent new concepts or something that we want to abstract over. And lines of code. This is most typical measure that is often used for estimating of cost of rewriting software. And when related with function points, it's estimated, used as estimation of the complexity and efficiency. There is also so-called McCabe and Halstead metrics, which are basically measuring the number of operators and symbols in each fragment of the code. And comparing the ratio, they estimate how difficult it is to read. It's basically correspondent on of slash a Kinkite metric for English language for readability. So when we uh, look at the understandability, we can either measure a number of comments uh, per function, class, type, or module uh, per line of code, of course or do flash king kites, so basically check the readability of the English language within the code. And of course the tell is supposed to have the goal of highlighting the complex code, but moreover, and more, more uh, practically, uh, we want to provide the value of the metrics for each of the code fragments, and guide refactoring. So for each of the reports that cross particular thresholds, warning thresholds, we'll just report these code fragments. If everything is correct and we don't want to gather metrics, then we will just say there are no warnings in this code. It looks like it's well decomposed, well, well refactored <coughs> from the point of view of the metrics. There may be other factors that matter, but from the point of view of the metrics, it looks okay. Of course, it's purely statistical. If somebody puts ha 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 in comments, that will not really help. <laughs> so the ontology that I use in complexity is that we have validation criteria that are based on different metrics. These metrics have thresholds, and depending on these thresholds, we have messages with different threshold levels, with different severity. <coughs> And the, valid, the metrics are applied for different code fragments, so we may have the same metric that is applied to different code fragments, like function or module. And the, there are different kinds of metrics, among them comment metrics, type metrics, and code metrics. So the metrics that we check for the comments, uh, the most important is the code to comments ratio, which is actually mixed with code metric. This is only partially implemented now, but it's coming soon. Uh, for the code, uh, we measure uh, first lines of code, that's pretty apparent, cyclomatic complexity. So how many different paths are in each function? How many different ways can con conditions be satisfied? For the simplest example, if you have a function that just adds two numbers, cyclomatic complexity is one. If you have if in this function, the circumvalmatic complexity is two because you have then arm and else arm. Yeah? So how many different cycles or how many different paths you can take in the same function? If you have the case expression with eight arms and that, that's the only conditional in the function, then it would be eight. Branching depth. So basically, if you have a 
case or within a case and within case expression, the not only cyclomatic complexity may grow, but it's also difficult to read because there are like five nested branches. So the com complexity also will warn about this. And number of total expression nodes per function. So sometimes the number of lines of code doesn't really reflect the length of the function because we have so many nodes and so many things per line it's really difficult to read what is inside. That probably should be decomposed into uh, different uh, sub-functions or local functions. Why is it dotted? Oh, what? because Why it's dotted? it's undergoing work basically. I should oh. also dot the uh, code to comments ratio because it's not fully implemented. Everything else is fully implemented. Oh. Then uh, for the types, I um, count the number of uh, the nodes in the type tree. So basically, I, I think all of us have seen the types that actually look like monsters. So they span three lines and they have like 20 expression nodes, uh, 20 type nodes inside, yeah? So 20 different type operators and variables and so on. They are difficult to read. So I issued a warning for everyone that is basically too long because then you can use new types or type aliases to abstract over components of this, yeah? Like endo is the simplest example. Any function from the same type into the same type can be defined as endo a. There are much more complex types that are better expressing something that are complex type trees. And the number of function arguments. This is for the same. <coughs> I basically analyze all the type signatures within the code and for each of them I made these checks. If there are any other suggestions about this, uh, I welcome them. Uh, this doesn't include, of course, the type classes. Now, for the, uh, the comment metrics, uh, I'm also about, besides the total number of comments, also about to implement flash concave metric, which basically divides the number of words in a sentence by the, if I remember, oh, I forgot. But Lawrence, if he, he would be here, he would probably repeat. It's a simple ratio of the length of the sentences. And then I basically was, was actually uh, surprised how easy it is to implement this. So I basically took Haskell source X, which is a full-fledged parser for Haskell language. Then I used Uniplate to basically go into depth in, of each expression or a fragment of the code and limited myself to only checking certain uh, types of the <coughs> fragments and made the, the functions on that. So the code is very short and concise. So the code fragments that I have are basically types, they are functions, global functions, or, and modules for now. That, that's sufficient. In the future I will also uh, separately treat, treat classes because it would be also nice to not have two large classes, for example. And records. But it, it was so far very simple. The metrics could be easily abstracted for any object that has, for, for example, contains expressions or types, can be very as easily abstracted as functions from a type to particular uh, metric value. And the only thing we need to do with this metric value is to check the threshold and show the value. So it's also very easy to reuse the metrics. And then we have thresholds that are configurable for each metric and to give the severity at different thresholds. The roadmap for the future is to show more code to comment metrics and possibly calibrate operator metrics like is a flash kinkade calibrated basically by checking the uh, defect density in some of the open source projects and compare it with the com complexity metrics derived by complexity.
because the statistics that we know are more common for C code. They probably do not reflect the complexity of Haskell code. So that would be it. But now is the best part, because now that, that, that was a presentation, that was boring. We can actually run it, yeah? And it's pretty simple. So you basically <coughs> can Cabal install complexity because it is already on Hackage. I was actually surprised because it's like one day after I put it on GitHub, I got first patch. And if it's not on Hackage, you can get latest version from GitHub. Yeah. So my GitHub is here. So it's basically mguida complexity. Yeah, very simple. So it, you can install it from there. It usually takes a while, a while for the first time because you need to get all these Haskell source acts and they take a while to build. But the complexity itself is pretty quick. And let's check what we have. I built it in the home directory, but what, what do we have for the project itself? Hmm. Oh, not this one. Ah, because I did something. I sim simulated the directory with my older project. There's a bit. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, so it tells you, okay, there is a type signature in, uh, for the function measure all that has six arguments. This should probably be less than five, so that's kind of warning, that's not really serious. And it correctly parses 14 or, or 14 output files, so it doesn't crash, it doesn't parse the file, it just reports you that, sorry, the statistics is incomplete. So this is because I basically checked this uh, source code where before I uh, committed the latest patches to make sure that it, it looks good. But may maybe something about my previous project. It's a bit bigger. But you see, uh, there are certain problems. So there is function of cyclomatic complexity of 52. So in C, it's usually thought that the, the function with cyclomatic complexity of 20, with 20 different conditional arms, for example. So above this, it's too big. It should be split because it's very high likelihood that there is a defect. And this is particularity for Haskell that we sometimes have case expressions with multiple, really many arms. So basically we have these algebraic types with possibly like 100 constructors. I'm not sure what to do about it because they sometimes make sense. Yeah? So maybe in this case, if it's this particular kind of constructor that we need to match upon, maybe we should ignore this one. But if it's not the case over a constructor with, <coughs> many, with, with over type with many constructors, that probably is a valid warning that we should correct it. Next, I have type signature for FG Atom that has eight arguments, and I must say I recall that FG Atom was actually uh, abstracted sub record that is shared between different records that was giving me difficulty, but I didn't really reflect on why it happens. I can also say that these are the parse sheet and parse helix functions were a problem only for some time because they are pretty well tested. I had a lot of unit tests for these ones. Next, type signature for print list. Has six arguments, should be less than five. That actually didn't give me so much problem during, during implementation. Next, parse aniso. Ooh, this was ugly. It seems that it's just 24 lines of code, but uh, during unit testing I had a lot of problems because it's actually not where specified on the PDB website. So it's probably not for here. Function guest element has 65 lines and also has pretty high... Yeah. Uh, so, so it should be probably shorter. In this case probably it should be also ignored because I know that guest element has 
this case that basically you need to guess element from uh, uh, I mean a chemical element from atom name in a PDB when it's not explicitly assigned and since the uh, PDB has really plenty atom names it's just basically case by case analysis CA means carbon alpha means it's carbon element there is absolutely no rule in that. so this we have to go through and so on some, some, some of these warnings may be uh, good all of them should be usable in Vim or in Emax or similar editor in quick fix mode so basically in the mode where, where you get it highlighted line by line when you have a warning and you can regulate the severity that was actually the first user request you can make your own thresholds yeah? so how do you feel when you have something about no no I know this is fine Please so yell at me again about this. So, still, the, at the moment, there is no treatment of annotation not to yell. It will be implemented. But in most cases, I actually, if you try to think about it, I split the function into smaller parts. So, in most cases, actually, these warnings were valid. The possibly one weak point is these multiple cases. So if it's just simple case expression, that usually is actually a signal that it's just many combinations that you need to treat one by one. But is there a bit of annotations for, for the end of the code? Or? So basically annotation that says do not yell for this warning. But in, in the code, like in the comment? Yeah, basically, yes. So. I would do it the same as HLint, I think, does, and many other uh, linters. So basically, you indicate in the comment no warn and name of the warning. If there are better suggestions, I would welcome them. Uh, I understand that we want to disable that somehow as a use of the tool. What I'm afraid of is that people start submitting patches based on a tool to projects that I would maintain. <laughs> so I would for sure reject them. And I don't I, want them. I, I'm, I'm not sure. It really depends. In many cases, what I've seen, so when I check GHC code, when I've seen the worst parts, they were really the worst parts. So basically the functions that have like 100 lines of code and triple nested conditionals, and they should be split into small. Okay, well, I, was not, I was really also talking about the annotations, not about. Uh, ah, like yeah, I mean, somebody, please, uh, yeah, so probably there should be also an option of keeping it instead of annotations in the source code uh, in, in, I don't know, dot file for the project, and then you can just add this noisy dot file, and that, that would also work. Yeah. But I have an actual Yes. Um, so currently, like from me, from a user's perspective, um, I would just laugh, and I, maybe I've already does it, like a prioritized list. You know, like we have different metrics, right? And we can combine them. And probably there's a hot spot which needs most attention. Yes, is, is that's somehow true. Somehow implemented or on the roadmap. Or? At the mo at the moment, I do not yet know how to combine them because I didn't okay. make a statistical analysis. Okay. I think that that would be the next step after statistical analysis to to make this work. So currently they are just printed in the order they are discovered or uh, parsed. Yeah, them. yes. Uh, th there is also an option to to limit by severity. So I normally run them in error only first, and then usually that's the first threshold. But it can be also sorted by a metric value. Mm -hmm. There are some other interesting things that you would then probably want to combine with, or there's a code yeah. climate. Um, and what code climate also gives you is somehow is like how much change a particular part of the code gets, you know? Mm -hmm. You could also get that from Git history, I guess. Yeah. I mean, they hook into GitHub, but you could also just look at Git history, mm -hmm. and then, of course, like, the code that touch more, and has a lot of problems, that, that one I would want to have at the top, and then, then I for sure want to use it every day, I guess. Yeah, uh, maybe it's not easy, but that's probably a yeah. very good idea to implement just Git query. Yeah. Um, you can see on the screen right now that you have a problem with the new version. Is that the 
Uh, yes, so there are still, since, since as, as I said, it's very preliminary version, so basically it sometimes fails to parse the Haskell file, and usually it is either extensions that were wrongly unrecognized by the parser, so Haskell SRC X basically does preliminary scan of which extensions to use. I'm also very permissive about these extensions. But still sometimes some are missed. Uh, and also sometimes I miss the cabal because most of these macros are actually cabal macros. So I could just include the cabal H file. I, I, I will have to add the option to add this on the path because it just doesn't find it. Yeah, I, I, I talked to um, Roman Chetuyaka about this, yeah. who is the maintainer of the SS source, so one of the maintainers. And I think he mentioned a, a way to run these static tools through Kabar. So yeah, that's sure that probably that the best idea. He's only Haskell code, but he's exactly what, what Kabar would need to yeah. do. Yeah, that, that's probably the best idea. I, I probably need to ask you later about the details because I didn't use it yet. I just know about Kabbal exec, and maybe Kabbal exec is sufficient because I already use CPP. Uh, sorry, I already use the C. Oh, that, that also doesn't help. Okay, I already use the CPP HS for preprocessing the code. Uh, so but you, you do that manually. You you pipe. And you pipe your files through CPPHS? Uh, no, no, I, I use it as a library. So, okay. yeah. yeah. The, the only problem is that CPPHS, for it to work, it needs to know about the macros that are defined. Yeah. And in my case, I don't pass it any parameters that would tell it which macros to use. Yeah. Yes? So, this is a pretty technical exercise, right? You're basically analyzing the code that you have like a bunch of warning telling you this is good or not good. Um, you have a code sample from where it says it is bad, and the same code sample when you refactor it to a way that looks better. So, yeah. you can basically get like the impression what you actually, what you actually change in the code to see if it's like for it. Yourself subjectively also complicated to read, not just based on that. So uh, the first, thing, the, the way this the statistical analysis are usually made, basically check it on a Git or something similar repository. That you you can check what are the changes, how often they are marked as bug fix, and how often they are applied to these wars version of the code, yeah? So if you have a, a code section that has a, a lot of bug fixes, and if it still looks like it has bad statistics, then it is a signal that it's correlated. The other way is just to ask people how they feel about reading it. Yeah. And usually the bad statistics, if it's really bad, it's clear signal that people will not read it easily. That, that's why I basically ask for like a sample of as you said, while developing the tool, basically use the tool to guide you in developing it. Yeah. So if you have like a sample of code that you wrote and the tools like wasn't so good and then how the market changed the way the script. Yeah, so I basically applied it to itself and refactored it slightly. That helped with some of the code fragments. I looked at the hotspots that I remember from my previous project. There was still some correlation between those parts that gave me difficulty and those parts that are signaled as potential hotspots. Yeah? So that's, that's all I have for now. Possibly later on one can apply it to Rosetta code and check it out. There is something similar. Is there a possibility of checking for you, the usage of raw types, so passing a boolean around? I mean, actually, boolean is not necessarily very useful. You can't type check on a boolean properly. You want to pass fail, pass pass, rather than just true false. Or, or using float instead of you want know, price, quantity, quantity, uh, different things. I don't yet have an idea how to do this. 
but isn't that kind of a but, but, and what, what, what you can do, <laughs> what you can do possibly, is besides checking out how it would be, is to check for the common words that appear in functions that always take double. So check price, add price, subtract price, maybe should have a price parameter here and be just uh, instances of the type class noon or something like this. Yeah. It's not yet, I don't know, yet know how to do it. So far I didn't go that deep. deep. Sorry. Well, coming from doing JavaScript, one of the, and one of the Haskell things is I should type everything. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Should, should be the kind of thing you want. I, I think it's just much, much more complicated than counting the number of arguments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the current version does is not very sophisticated. It, it's helpful, maybe, but it's not that sophisticated. So. And uh, when, when there are signals that maybe you should introduce a type, yeah? But they are usually detected when you apply something to the wrong tag, when you have an implicit invariant. So basically, I would say it would be easier to de detect when you have an error raised. Hmm, I again uh, applied it something to something that is not really the, the right thing. Then I would introduce it. So the cues for the re re refactoring may be also other. I, I would say a very strong cue besides the exception report or failure to apply it to the right thing is that uh, you have difficulty remembering which kind of double it was out of 10 kinds <laughs> or you are adding as I said uh, the word price to like 20 different functions Maybe the amount of the parameters should be slightly over. Like it's kind of okay to have uh, five or six parameters of function if they're different type. But if it's uh, in four integers or four strings, it definitely something wrong here. And it's uh, probably it's a case where we have to introduce uh, some uh, type aliases or like what they say that we have to introduce uh, price instead of uh, double. So it's not just check for amount of arguments, but yeah. exactly the amount of those of the same type. Yeah, yeah. And maybe maybe very good. Yeah, I, I'm, I I would be added. No more questions. Okay, so uh, as I saw, said, Zonke promised introduction to algebraic data types. I actually promised that I will commit to something myself. Yeah except that I don't know. It's probably <laughs> going to be a game or a web application. I'm not sure in which order it will be. But I'm for, I promise that I will also prepare a 101 on, on something cool. So it's meant for, for it has the meetups. Yeah. On each meetup, you're going to have something simple, a static idea. So yes. You quite got it yet. Yeah. And, and if you have short so of advanced speakers, we will have two one ones. Kind of yeah. Is it like you have always a simple one and more challenging? Yeah, I okay. think that would be optimal setup. <coughs> Anybody else wants to volunteer? I also propose that uh, on the weekend, I'm not sure if it would be this weekend, if whoever is interested, I will be mentoring people in Haskell in the hackerspace. It will probably be Saturday, maybe not early morning. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe about lunchtime <laughs> and after. Uh, if anybody wants, please just message me on Meetup or whatever. I'm sure there will be more than one person because I already got queries. And if there are so many people, I will just ask Lawrence or maybe some other people that like new Haskellers to join me. Yeah? I think these people already know who will be asked. and if. Uh, they feel like they should be asked and I didn't ask them. That's my fault, they should just come. <laughs> <laughs> Any requests about the future talks, that we, the topics that we would like to hear or suggestions?
this provides at least one suggestion. <laughs> I'm sure there should be feedback. Uh, <coughs> yes. I was reading about like different classes of programming languages, like for people who have like absolutely no background of functional programming. So I started from <coughs> that point, and at some point in time, like the difference between imperative programming languages and functional programming languages begins to kind of overlap, and you know, there's a gray area and some like. So I was reading about Scala, and I didn't quite you know like see whether it was clearly a functional language or failure, and so which class did, did it belong to? So we could kind of give an ex like a very simple set of examples that can help you know like help me to look at like functional piece of code and uh, doing the same thing as an imperative language and, and, and can like see the difference clearly how things are working you know the nuts and bolts so so do you, do you want me to write uh, an imperative uh, DSL in Haskell no, then <laughs> logic DSL. Yeah. I can do that. I can write imperative code in Haskell and show you that it looks like basic, because I I read the the Lena's blog posts. So basically, there are people that actually, for for exercise, also for practical purposes, have tasks that are particularly suited for certain language like emulating <coughs> basic interpreter, and that can be written in basic. It looks almost like basic. It even has lines of code. There, there is also a huge opportunity in implementing assembler as a model. Obviously, some people prefer assembler as applicative. I think it's a very practical, cool idea. I can invite the people who will definitely be interested in uh, talk like this because they, it's like over the head if you start to explain how the Milner works to someone who wrote the code in Java for eight years. And uh, they, yeah, they interested that probably it would be a way to increase our audience. Okay, so types of programming languages or, or paradigms yeah. in programming. Uh, and the Hindley Mirna uh, for Java programmers. <laughs> so that, that, that will be a bit more difficult, but we will uh, bear with it. it uh, also, the same. so showing how to approach problem from yeah. a perspective and the functional style, because it's not just different languages, it's a, a approach that's different. Yeah. You can code actually in the Java in functional way, and the talk like this will yeah. definitely... Uh, okay, good. But, uh, and one more thing, like, I'm, I'm not asking you to like do imperative style coding in Haskell. You can use a, like, a normal language. I don't want <laughs> <laughs> I, I will make it look like Java. I will even introduce the, uh, the parentheses for the parameters. You could use Java and you could use Haskell to do what Haskell does in Java to do. Use Java for what Java is supposed to do and then show me the difference between them. You don't okay. need to like... Yeah. Yeah. That's a bit, a bit yeah. more difficult. I need your collaboration. <laughs> I understand you volunteer because you know Java. <laughs> Java. <laughs> uh, I prefer your approach. You don't need uh, Java to show a code. Mm -hmm. I think it will be easier to use yeah. one language so, for and show the two approaches. It's not about custom and Java. It's about imperative and functional yeah, approach. Yeah, exactly. to, okay. So yeah. I think your approach is actually more by, by okay. using the same language. Okay. Okay. So I, I would suggest that you just uh, message me. Sure. I will prepare the presentation and make sure that it's as Java possible. As Java like as possible, and I will ask you for feedback. Yeah. The same for the your query. Yeah. So uh, for me, I actually I, I'm coming from a JavaScript background, and then slowly I transition into functional programming. So what I realized is that I I have applied a lot of the uh, Haskell functional programming concepts in mm -hmm. JavaScript, and and as as I learn more and more, like from the, the functors and all, that, all these concepts, I realized I can actually like implement a Haskell like type system in JavaScript. In plain JavaScript. And and so so I don't I think how, like, how do you enforce type checks in JavaScript? Uh, um, it's not really about type check but about the composition like what you know, if you have an F map and so you can uh, generate the new methods. So, yeah. so that's that's some idea I'm still exploring and because I'm still trying to learn about the Haskell. But I think like that, if I manage to do that, then it would be like educational to like uh, to help people from their yeah. informative learning background to understand like uh, yeah. Yeah. about the functional learning concepts. Okay. Yeah.
So we want to talk about it um, in a way approachable to us. Yeah. <coughs> so so this is like a mixture of JavaScript. Yeah, yeah this is like a mixture of both imperative, <coughs> also like imperative and and uh, and functional. So. Uh, the other thing, there was a proposal for da simple data processing, like high performance data processing in Haskell as a tutorial, so basically parsing CSV file and so on. Uh, possibly simple 3D programming in Haskell. Anything else? Uh, auto approach asynchronous in Haskell? Async programming. Yeah. So, so we, yeah. And mixing async and uh, IO. Okay. Um, the way it works, usually we treat them together. Unless we have so called deterministic parallelism or concurrency, where we have only way, one way to finish it. Maybe asynchronous, but the result can be only one. Okay. Asynchronous that doesn't mean parallel, and I'm talking specifically about asynchronous uh, programming and uh, I.O. in the asynchronous program. You mean asynchronous I.O.? No. Uh, like promises. So, for example, it's a uh, server that uh, serves request and they serve them uh, in asynchronous uh, way. And uh, sometimes it uh, starts like few other asynchronous tasks and some of them uh, have to do some I.O. So we mix it, so we have an uh, asynchronous uh, event and then we want to do I.O. So like this. How to mix them uh, together in Haskell. Okay. It's like one of the cases where it's easy to like, it hold, uh, hold you in a corner where you don't know how to access uh, IO from where you're passing for. Okay. Any other requests, suggestions? At the end, I would have a uh, small announcement if we still have five minutes in the corner. Oh, of course! <laughs> wait, I have to wait. This okay, is let, let's, okay, let's wait until other people. <laughs> okay, so who wants to come for the uh, hackerspace based mentorship in Haskell? Whoa! Hey, great! Okay, I, I, will, I, I think I will ask another mentor to join. Thank you. Please, please. So, yeah, yeah, yeah.